Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dan McGuire. I'm the president of the MIT Club of New Hampshire, and it's our pleasure to have with us Professor Brian Bryson of the uh, Biological Engineering uh, Department at MIT, which is course 20. And I'm so old that I didn't even know there was such a thing <laughs> until just, just recently, but apparently um, they've had uh, undergrads, they've had a PhD for over 20 years, he says, and, and undergrads for uh, 13. And so, um, and he is a graduate of both. And so uh, we're going to learn about tuberculosis and, and maybe a little about COVID, I don't know. But Professor Bryson, please share your screen and thank you for coming. Great. Um, thank you for the introduction, Dan, and thank you all for um, Thank you all uh, for being here tonight. Um, so it's a really uh, fun time, uh, I will say, an in infectious disease, and it's a great <laughs> opportunity to be able to present some of the work that we've been doing in my research group. Um, so I started my research group at MIT in uh, July of 2018, so I've been there for a little under three years. Um, and our lab is really interested in applying next generation approaches to understand infectious diseases. And um, I think it goes without saying that that's an important problem. Um, but before I start in on my, uh, the rest of my talk, what I wanna talk to you about what you see on this slide right here, um, because it's a theme of almost every infectious disease, but we don't really fully understand it. Um, <laughs> so what are looking at on this slide? So what you're looking at are uh, cells of the innate immune system. So that's the first line of defense. And that you, what you can see here are their nuclei here in blue. And what I actually did in this experiment when I was a postdoc is I infected the uh, immune cells with a fluorescent strain of mycobacterium tuberculosis, which are these rod-shaped objects. And I then actually engineered the bacterium to express two colors. So um, if they're alive, they're red only. And if they're dead, um, or if they're, alive, if they're alive, they're red and green, and if they're dead, they can only express the red fluorescent protein. Um, and what you can see, and what I hope you can take away from this slide, is that there's actually a striking amount of heterogeneity in the system. So we see some, um, let's just go to laser pointer, you can see some that are red exclusively, and then you see some that are red-green double positive. And this is actually one of the most complicating things about a host pathogen interactions is that uh, the interaction between the pathogen, be it a fungal pathogen, bacterial pathogen, viral pathogen, and the host can be incredibly heterogeneous in terms of the outcome. And this is one of the things that as an engineer really brings me a lot of intellectual joy is trying to understand what are the determinants of the outcome. So, and then secondly, if we can understand what are those determinants of the outcome, can we actually start beginning to think about how we can intervene and design a system or design therapeutic interventions that allow us to tip the scale? And so that's really going to be the theme of my talk today. Um, and the other way that I think about it when we think about uh, pathogens in particular is that small changes can have big impacts. And this is going to also be a theme of my talk where we can think about a viral pathogen or mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is about two microns long. And um, obviously these pathogens have been a scourge on human history. Tuberculosis is one of human health's top Human, human history's top 10 killers of all time. Um, and uh, what my research group really does is we bridge approaches in molecular immunology, bioengineering, and quantitative modeling to study these host pathogen interactions. And so the first host pathogen interaction I'm gonna talk about today is that between um, mycobacterium tuberculosis and the human host. And it goes without saying that tuberculosis is still a huge global health problem. Tuberculosis is estimated to impact 2 billion people. So a quarter of the global population is expected is, uh, to be infected with this bacterium. It results in about 4,000 deaths per day. So that's about a, a little over a million deaths per year. Um, now, one of the things that makes TB really, really incredibly difficult to even predict um, is that while 2 billion people might be infected with the bacterium, actually only about one in 10 develops what we call active disease which is characterized by coughing up blood, weight loss, and fatigue. Now, not all hope is lost because uh, we do have an antibiotic regimen that is effective for drug-sensitive TB. And that antibiotic regimen is four drugs for about six to nine months. 
Um, so that's a lot. Um, if you think about like the last time that you may have been on antibiotics, you may have been on them for two weeks. Now imagine doubling that by a factor of 18 and then taking four pills a day instead of one. And you know what my group really focuses on and what would be transformative for the field is a licensed protective vaccine. Now I'll say here that we do not have one for TB though we've been calling it tuberculosis for over a hundred years. Um, and this is one of the big challenges that inspires the work in my group. And so just to kind of give everybody a kind of a TB 101 in terms of what we understand, because I would say that there's many knowledge gaps that have yet to be filled. Um, uh, I'll walk you through the kind of the immunological life cycle of the kind of 30,000 foot view. And what does that look like? So tuberculosis is transmitted via aerosol. Um, so an infected individual will cough. There will be bacteria in the airway that can be then dropletized into droplets. Um, those droplets, you know, are in the air, and then another individual will inhale those droplets, and then that back the bacteria will make their way down into the alveolar space of the lung. And what's really amazing about the alveolar space of the lung, like many of our different tissues that are exposed to the environment, is that we have immune cells that kind of surveil the area to try to understand, is there a foreign pathogen or even just foreign body that needs to be cleared? And one of those kind of frontline innate uh, immune cells that kind of uh, contributes to a lot of immune defense is what's called a macrophage. Um, what you need to know about a macrophage is that it is a, what we call a phagocyte. So it goes around and it eats things up and it tries to get rid of it. Um, and so when this macrophage actually encounters TB, it takes up the bacterium. And then what it does is it kind of results in the, uh, the initiation of an immune response. And what this immune response will eventually do is drive the recruitment of other immune cells to the site of infection. And this kind of collection of immune cells in the setting of TB is called a granuloma. And now the thing to know about a granuloma is that it's a really highly dynamic, heterogeneous kind of structure of cells. And the thing to know about is that it oftentimes takes a very stereotypical kind of structure. Um, this granuloma is kind of a collection of infected cells, uninfected cells. And then you have uh, these other immune cells called lymphocytes. And lymphocytes are very important, especially in the era of vaccination, because lymphocytes contribute to much of the immune, immunological memory that we have. And these lymphocytes in the setting of TB form this kind of lymphocyte cuff. Now, here's where it gets really exciting about a granuloma. So here's what I'll tell you. So these granulomas are, um, you can have multiple different granulomas in the same individual. Um, and the important thing to know here is that in some of these granulomas, the bacteria will be fully sterilized. So this system can fully clear and eliminate the pathogen. Now in the same lung, you can have a different granuloma where the bacteria are growing no problem. Now, um, and this is kind of mind blowing because um, it means that the immune response can actually succeed. Um, so that means that in the absence of antibiotics, the immune response can fully sterilize infection. And this is what gives immunologists, immunologists like myself hope because it says that the immune response can do it. And what we really need to be able to do is figure out how to get there. Um, now, there's a lot of other things that can happen to a granuloma, but I just want to emphasize the one that we really care about a lot is the time when the granuloma starts to grow uncontrollably and you have a lot of uncontrolled bacterial growth that results in the death of the immune cells nearby. And what this results in is the collapse of this granuloma, allowing the bacteria to go back into the airway to be subsequently expelled again. So this is the life cycle that we understand. Now, why don't we have a vaccine for tuberculosis? And that could be an entire one hour talk in itself, but I'm gonna summarize what some of the kind of the bottlenecks in terms of understanding TB are and why it's been taking us a little bit of time. So like I said, we can have these individual granulomas that fully sterilize and some that don't in the same individual, but we really don't fully yet understand what are those immune host determinants of what drives that control. Now, on the other side, you know, this is a, comp a complex kind of cellular choreography where you have the immune system and you have the pathogen. And, you know, the pathogen is not an inert organism. The pathogen is trying to uh, 
survive itself. And the way that it survives is through a whole host of what we call virulence programs that really try to disrupt everything that the immune cell tries to throw at it. The bacterium is trying to outwit, outrun, and outcompete all of these processes. But we still don't even understand all of those components of like, we still have like hundreds of bacterial genes that we know the sequence, but we don't know the function. And so this is just another uh, bottleneck in our understanding. Now, um, what are, and so, and as we think about those knowledge gaps, we also have to think about the limitate, the, the challenges that we must overcome just simply in the research. Um, so tuberculosis is studied, um, is a highly virulent pathogen, uh, aerosolized. And so as a consequence, that pathogen must be studied in a biosafe of little three environment. So we're in full Tyvek suits, um, negative pressure rooms. Um, these rooms are actually about four, th $4,000 a square foot to construct. Um, and uh, the other thing I'll say about tuberculosis is it is not a rapidly growing pathogen. So just to give you a kind of um, a kind of by the numbers, if we think about salmonella, which can drive food poisoning, that pathogen doubles about every 35 minutes. By contrast, tuberculosis doubles about every 24 hours. So um, you can imagine that if you're trying to study a slow growing pathogen, it just means the research goes a lot slower sometimes. Okay, so that's just to give you a lay of the land of like, what's, how do you even study this, pa this pathogen? And so one of the questions that we wanted to ask when we started our research group was, what does the early immune response to, uh, to MTB or mycobacterium tuberculosis look like? Okay. So how do we do that? Um, and how do we want to do that is an, another important question. Now, okay, so animal models can be incredibly powerful for the study of tuberculosis. But one of the things that we know about tuberculosis disease in humans is that we have this really complex clinical spectrum. You've probably heard about latent disease and active disease. Now, by contrast, some of these small animal models like mice, like mice can be a really powerful tool. Um, but in the setting of mice, mice don't develop this spectrum of clinical disease. Um, and the best animal models that actually recapitulate some of this kind of clinical diversity that we observe is the non-human primate. And so what has the non-human primate helped us learn? So um, what's really great about non-human primates is that you can experimentally study them in some of these primate centers that are um, spread across the country. And I'll just kind of summarize two really important findings out of those that work. So what you can do is a vet, uh, a, a veterinarian can um, install bacteria into the lung, um, and as few as three bacteria can cause full-blown TB disease. Um, now, using kind of the latest and greatest in kind of biological engineering and genetic sequencing, what we can also do is we can barcode those bacteria in their genome. So each individual bacteria has its own unique barcode. And then what we can do is we can actually install those bacteria in the lung and just see what happens. Now, by using techniques like PET-CT or just x-ray, what we can also do is we can actually track dynamically the course of inflammation in the lung. And what's really great is that the course of inflammation, these hot spots, are very much correlated with where we know the bacteria are. And so what this does is this kind of gives us like a, a molecular laser, so to speak, to know exactly when we go and it's time to harvest the animal, um, where to expect to find bacteria. And what's great about that is you can then take out these individual lesions or granulomas and then isolate the DNA and ask what barcodes are represented, how many barcodes are represented. And the punchline there is that if you do that experiment, what you find is that by and large, these individual lesions are founded by or represented by a single barcode. So what does that mean? What that means is that these kind of this local, this highly local disease in the lung of tuberculosis is really initiated by the interaction of a single bacterium with a single immune cell. Um, and this is really important because it's really kind of helps us understand, like, if we're trying to model the early response to MTB, what that means we need to be able to do is we need to be able to have techniques and tools that really allow us to kind of really characterize what the immune response to very few bacteria look like. Okay.
And then the other thing that's really important is like, Brian, like how much does it, uh, you know, how much does a TB infected individual actually cough out? You're saying that you can, you can cause disease with very few bacteria, but is that, is that physiologically meaningful? Okay, so what I wanna do is I wanna like take us all on a trip to South Africa now um, where tuberculosis is very endemic. Um, and one of the things that's been done in South Africa is the really what I call an engineering feat. So as I was describing to you, these biosafety level three environments that have all this negative pressure where they can collect and recycle out the air and filter it, um, imagine now building that for an individual. And so that's in fact what was done in South Africa, where somebody who is like confirmed, uh, piece, uh, confirmed positive for TB is then before being uh, offered antibiotics is asked to sit in this, what we'll call a personal biosafety level three for two hours. You can see this chair here in seven, you see a TV. And what they're done is they're, clo they're closed into this room and they're allowed to just cough and breathe and just do everything that they would normally do. And they're just asked to sit in this room. And you know what they did with this box is they actually allow, the box is designed such that you can collect all of the expelled air. And so by collecting this expelled air, you can ask if you have really sensitive tools to then say, if we can like, for example, have a specific dye that would allow us to identify tuberculosis specifically, then here at the outlet, you can say, okay, here is all the expelled air now concentrated down. And then if we can put in a dye that would allow us to enumerate how many bacteria are present, then we can actually ask this what has been a really inaccessible biological question is how much bacteria does an infected individual cough out? Okay, does anybody want to like take a guess um, about like what is the order of magnitude for how many bacteria are expelled by an, somebody who has active tuberculosis before I show you the next slide? Uh, I don't know, I'll say... Uh... One a minute? One a minute, okay. So that'd be about 120 if you're doing in two hours. Okay, so good estimate. Um, it's a factor of 10 less. So it's actually on the order of 10 bacteria are expelled, tens of bacteria are expelled by an active TB patient in the span of two hours. Um, which is really important because historically we have not had access to these measurements. And so we've just been kind of guessing when we design experiments in the laboratory, how many bacteria should we add for every immune cell to really try to begin to characterize what the immune response to TB looks like. But now this experiment tells us like maybe for the last 20 years, we've been doing everything the wrong way. But when you start your lab at the time of these experiments now becoming publicly available and the results becoming publicly available, you can totally pivot and you don't feel like you've lost any time. So that's what we did. And so what we did is we said, okay, now we actually need incredibly sensitive measurements to be able to detect what the interaction between very few bacteria and very few immune cells looks like. And so that's in fact what we did. And um, the way that we do this is using a technology called flow cytometry, which really um, to summarize, it's a fluidic system that allows you to like flow in individual cells into, a, uh, into an optical system that allows you to excite with different lasers and then monitor the expression of individual proteins. And so whatever protein you pick, if you can actually have a tool, have a reagent that is specific for that protein, you can now measure any one of the 20,000 proteins expressed by an immune cell and then characterize what's being expressed. And so the two things that were uh, characterized in this study that I'm going to describe to you are these two inflammatory uh, proteins or cytokines. So these are proteins that will be actually secreted by immune cells. Um, and uh, what was done is you can characterize their production. And so those two immune, uh, those two cytokines are uh, a cytokine called CCL3 and TNF. And you don't need to know much about their biological function right now, other than that they contribute to the recruitment of other immune cells to the site of infection. And what you can see here is when we do, when this group did this experiment, the following, the following observation was made. So what they did is they took a component of a synthetic component of the bacterial cell wall. And so the thing you need to know here is that bacteria are very diverse. And so as a consequence, their cell walls are very diverse. 
So we're going to take a component that is like present, very present in the salmonella cell wall. Um, and what you can do here is you can actually say, okay, I'm going to use defined concentrations of this particular ligand and then ask how much of these two inflammatory cytokines are produced. And what's really great about uh, flow cytometry is you can it, not, in, instead of measuring across the entire population and getting an average measurement, what we're doing is we're measuring at the level of individual cells. And so what you can see here is in the absence of adding this inflammatory bacterial cell wall component, not many of the cells are expressing either TNF or CCL3. Um, at the other extreme, at 100 nanomolar, which is just a high concentration, you can see that nearly all of the cells become high for both TNF and CCL3. And nearly all of the cells are responding. What's really interesting, however, is when you look in these intermediate concentrations, at 10 nanomolar, it's almost still all the cells responding. At 1 nanomolar, it's just almost all the cells are responding. But now when we drop by another factor of 10, actually only about 18% of the cells are responding. And what was really exciting about this study is that it suggests that what's happening is that there's a threshold that you must overcome in order to really be able to mount an effective inflammatory response. Okay, so um, just to summarize what, this take, what the takeaway is, that in order to really, um, we don't want to cry wolf at the sight of like one blip on the radar. What the immune system has been able to do, at least in this setting, is actually allow us to filter out between low concentration and high concentration signal. So this is awesome, but you can begin to ask the question, okay, well, like if you have this filter for like very low signal, is TB sensed? as a high concentration, especially when we're thinking that actually very few bacteria are actually starting infection. So that's what we set out to ask. Okay, and I just always like to recognize the superheroes behind the work. So this is Sydney Solomon. She's a fourth year graduate student in my group. Um, and this is a very complicated and busy slide, but what you need to know is that the experiment that I described to you before was uh, focused on a particular bacterial cell wall component that binds to a particular receptor on the surface of the cells. So the way that the cells are going to communicate with the extracellular environment is by having all, the, all these receptors on the surface and binding to different ligands and saying, oh, I see this, I need to do this, right? So it's a way of communicating, bridging between the extracellular environment and the intracellular environment. Now, one of those molecular bridges or receptors in the setting of TB is a receptor that we call TLR2, or toll-like receptor two. And what you need to know about this is the MTB cell wall has many lipids or lipoproteins. So these are lipid protein, fat protein conjugates, um, and they can be bound by this receptor, toll-like receptor two. And that's how, that's one of the ways that TB can be sensed. Okay, so what we wanted to next understand is while we see this kind of very nice thresholded like response for toll-like receptor four, the question was, does this also hold for toll-like receptor two? And so the experiment that we did here is we did a very similar experiment where instead of looking for CCL3 and TNF, what we did set, decided is let's just look at TNF because that's easy enough. Um, and so what we did is we took a soluble component of bacterial cell walls that are similar to the soluble, the components of the MTB cell wall now, and we stimulated cells. And we said, okay, we've got this new receptor that we're going to try to engage. Is, do we see this similar kind of thresholded response? And to make a long story short, the answer is yes, because as we begin to titrate the concentration of this soluble ligand, PAM3CSK4, you can see that in the absence of stimulation, the cells aren't really producing TNF. Now, when you go up to a nanogram per mil, you see about 4% of the cells. And then as you begin to increase the concentration, you can see more and more cells responding. Now, something really interesting happened when we did this experiment, because um, even when we went to really, really high concentrations, one observation that we made is even as we started to go to really high concentrations of this ligand, um, we could actually really never get all of the cells to respond, which really blew our minds for some time. 
But um, after doing this experiment many, many, many times, uh, we convinced ourselves that this is reproducible. And so to kind of summarize where we are, we started with this conceptual model that was already in the literature, that their immune response has this threshold. We then wanted to extend it to look at the receptors that are thought to engage TB. And here, what I'm showing you is that when we do those experiments, in summary, what you can see is that as you know, at low concentrations, we don't see very much. And then there's this threshold at which, like, now, you, now the party starts, right? Um, and so this was really exciting to us. And so we have this conceptual model, but this doesn't, still doesn't answer the question about TB because we haven't done an experiment with TB yet. Okay, so what's really hard about studying very few bacteria interacting with immune cells? Okay, um, so the one of the real challenges is that um, for those of you who are maybe course 18 or physics, uh, course eight as undergrads, um, uh, TB infection proceeds as a Poisson process. So even if I take 50,000 bacteria and 50,000 immune cells, only about 30% of the immune cells will actually end up taking up bacteria. So you can imagine that if you're doing some type of average bulk measurement, you're going to actually be kind of masked by the population that actually took up bacteria and then the population that didn't take up bacteria. And in the case of a low, this 50,000 to 50,000, with only 30% of the cells taking up bacteria, the challenge here is that, you know, the minor population is maybe the population you care about. So how do we overcome that challenge? The way that we overcome that challenge is we say, okay, we're gonna go ahead and use those same, same techniques where we can do single cell measurements, but the next thing we need to be able to do is actually say which one is the infected cell and which one's a bystander. And the way that we do this is we use fluorescent bacteria so we can discriminate between here is an infected cell and here is its uninfected neighbor. And so now we can look in two dimensions and say, okay, we're going to measure uh, this TNF production, and then we're also going to measure GFP levels to look at which cells are the infected cells and which ones are not. And so to make a long story short, and this is kind of terrifying if I'm being honest, when we actually look at the cells, so now on the y-axis, we're looking at TNF, this inflammatory protein that is produced to really recruit other immune cells to the site of infection. And on the x-axis, we're looking at GFP as a marker of which cell is infected. You can see that when we, we infected our cells, we can see these two populations here where we have GFP low cells and here where we have GFP high cells. And we're gonna take these cells to be the cells that are infected. And then we can ask how many of those cells are actually producing this inflammatory protein TNF. And what I want you to take away from this is that actually only about one in every 50 cells actually produces the inflammatory protein. So it's like TB ends up in you and you don't even know because you're just like not responding. And so this is, um, you know, it's kind of like is a tree, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's around to hear it, did it really fall? Um, because you can think about it like if the immune response is not capable of detecting the bacterium, what can you actually do if you're not actually alerted to this process? Um, so this is really this was really exciting for us because it suggested that um, you know something. This might explain why so why people infected with TB don't know the next day that something is awry. All right, so um, you know. If you, if you, um, for those of you who are maybe course seven or like work in medicine to, or health or bio these days, you could be like, okay, Brian, um, but there's, you ref alluded to this kind of molecular choreography, so to speak, or cellular choreography between the host immune cell and the pathogen. How do you know the pathogen's not trying to actively interfere with this process? And so that's the question we wanted to ask next. So we see that no TNF is being produced, but that doesn't, but there's actually two ways to interpret that data. One interpretation is that TB is weak at inducing these responses. Or the second is that TB is actually incredibly exquisite at evading it. And what we wanted to do is come up with some experiments to be able to discriminate between these two models. And why was this even something that we wanted to think about? Because for example, um, a pathogen called Legionella pneumophila, which causes Legionnaire's disease, does something really amazing. 
And so let me just walk you through it. You're looking at here. So Legionella nemophila here is in, in green. And uh, using these really clever dyes that I won't go into a lot of chemical detail, you can look for kind of new protein synthesis in individual cells. And what you can take away from this first row here is that um, in this setting, um, with this particular Legionella strain, the cells that actually has the GFP bacteria, the fluorescent bacteria, actually has no new protein synthesis. Um, and this is because this bacteria has specific ways that it can secrete proteins that really disrupt the ability for immune cells to produce any new proteins. So it's like, okay, I'm going to infect, I'm going to get inside you, and I'm going to turn off your ability to alert your nearby neighbors that anything is awry. And so we reasoned that maybe TB is doing the same thing. Um, and so we actually tested that hypothesis, and the short answer is no. So what we can do here is we can actually infect cells with, um, we can do kind of a mock infection where we add no bacteria and we look at new protein synthesis. We can use a known drug that disrupts protein synthesis. And you can see here on this x-axis is protein synthesis. And you can see when we add the drug that is a known inhibitor of protein synthesis, we see a decrease in the level of new protein. Now, if we look at what we call the bystander cells, so these are cells that we that were in the setting of bacteria, but just didn't end up getting infected. And we look at the directly infected cells, they look no different from cells that underwent kind of this mock infection. And so the conclusion here is that TB is not directly infect, uh, disrupting new protein synthesis. And so in experiments that I won't um, go on to describe to you is we tried to explore specific questions whether or not, so this, so what I'll tell you about this experiment is this um, experiment says that there's no wholesale defect in protein synthesis, but it doesn't really answer the question of whether TB is specifically doing something in kind of precision molecular biology to disrupt the production of TNF. And so I won't go on to the, I won't uh, belabor the details of those experiments, but we came up with some clever ways to explore that hypothesis. And the short answer is that's not the case. Um, the, if the cells were challenged with the, with, if the cells were pushed to make um, this inflammatory protein, you could, I could actually make the infected cells produce TNF. So we don't think that TB is actively disrupting these processes specifically. Okay. Um, but when we think about what's happening at the global level, you know, here's just the plasma membrane of a cell. Here's a receptor, toll-like receptor 2, which can interact with TB. When we think about um, the production of these pro-inflammatory proteins or cytokines like TNF, there's a whole lot that's going on at the kind of the molecular level that bridge these kind of extracellular signals to cellular responses. Um, and this is all bridged by a really complex cascade of molecular events. Um, and using those same techniques that I described to you of flow cytometry and uh, fluorescent bacteria, we can actually probe other components of the cellular response to ask what's happening. And ask like where, so we see this defect here, but where further upstream is, are the wheels falling off the, uh, wheels falling off the car? So I won't um, tell you too much about what, how we, um, I'll tell you a little bit. Um, so we can actually go on to probe the levels um, of different proteins in this pathway using the same techniques that I described to you before. And one of the really interesting things that we observed is when we look, for example, at this protein called P38, which is a stress activated protein, it can get modified to really kind of turn on the party and drive these kind of uh, downstream events. One of the things that we observe is that if we actually take a soluble ligand like PAM3 cis um, versus MTB, what you can see over time is that um, with this soluble ligand, we see a really robust induction of uh, this kind of canonical immune response. Now, when we add TB, it's a flat line or nearly a flat line, suggesting that there's something really interesting about how TB may be interacting with this particular part of the pathway. And this is active work going on in my group to really try to understand what are the molecular mechanisms that underlie this process. But what's been really exciting about this work thus far is that we can take the literature, and I always think about the literature as a template, 
that we need to modify for every individual pathogen that we study. And one of the things that we've learned even in this simple study is that we can take this template that people have been using for the last 20 years and by really using these high resolution techniques, we're able to identify where things can go awry or where things are not behaving as they normally would. Okay, so um, I started all of this by saying, okay, here's this immunological life cycle that's happening in people. And what we do is we go into the lab and we use cells on a, on a Petri dish. Um, how reflective of this, how reflective of what we have observed and what I've described to you is something that we can observe in a higher organism or an intact organism. So um, I'm just gonna show you one piece of data where if you take experimental infection with non-human primates and you know that you added bacteria, um, unlike people where you don't know when they were infected, with animals, you have this experimental time point, time equals zero. And then you can longitudinally monitor the immune response. And this is often done by, you know, like when we go to the hospital and have, or the doctors and have our labs done and they draw blood and they can do a bunch of a profiling. If we kind of use the most high resolution techniques, we can actually look in a non-human primate that's been challenged with very few bacteria and then ask, how many different genes are differentially expressed or turned on following infection? And the punchline here is that if you actually infect a, a non-human primate at day zero and then ask, how long does it take to see something really robustly different in the bloodstream? It takes about 10 days. Um, and so that suggests that actually there is a muted delay in the immune response. Now, by contrast, if you did this experiment with salmonella, um, you would very much know that something is going on. And anybody of us who've ever had food poisoning, you know that if you had something that was not right, you know the next day. Um, so, this is really, so this is really inciting for us because it now allows us to go from kind of these like high resolution techniques that we can apply in the lab and then connect that to some of the observations that we see in people. So, um, so that's what I want to tell you about tuberculosis today. We're really excited to be able to use some of the latest and greatest techniques that allow us to really make, you know, this is kind of this, this, the, the, the glory of MIT in a lot of ways is that you have access to the very best in measurement techniques. And as we think about drilling further and further down to understanding what's happening when very few bacteria encounter immune cells, these super high resolution measurement techniques have been incredibly powerful for us to really kind of write the textbook for how these responses are happening. Okay, um, so that's what I want to tell you about TB, but um, I also want to talk about um, coronavirus. And I think it goes without saying that coronavirus has changed all of our lives. Um, and it's one of the worst pandemics we've seen in human history. Um, and, uh, and the second thing that I'll tell you is that, um, you know, it's also really terrifying to be a junior faculty and be asked to shut down your lab. Just as you think you finally got your feet on the ground and they say, actually, shut down, close your labs in the next 24 hours, um, and we don't know when you'll be back. Um, and, you know, this, you know, all of my talks I give are an ode to my trainees, but this is a really a special ode because I'm really kind of excited to share with you um, how we kind of rebounded from the pandemic and just like used our hobbies and our skills and our creativity to do something that has actually really made a profound impact on the course of the pandemic. So, um, but in order to really understand how we got here, um, I have to tell you the story of the student who did the work. And so this is a graduate student, Brian He. He actually just finished his PhD um, and he's a computer science student. But he's a computer science student with a variety of hobbies um, and a variety of interests. And actually, before he decided to go to MIT for graduate school, he'd actually gotten into the Harvard Literature Program. So this is somebody who can kind of uh, exist in two worlds. And when he, asked, when he asked to join the lab, he's like, you know, is it OK if I take Harvard electives? And I said, you know, that's fine. Um, and he's like, it's, it's literature. It's just for fun. And I was like, OK, fine. Everybody needs a hobby. Um, and, you know, when the pandemic hit, we said, okay, let's try to analyze data that we haven't analyzed yet or like plot it in a different way. But, you know, after four weeks of that, you kind of quickly run out of things to do. And he said, you know, um, 
I've run out of data to analyze from like stuff that I hadn't analyzed yet. So I have this interest from back when I was applying to graduate school about natural language processing algorithms. So I'm going to spend my downtime learning those algorithms. And then a little bit later on, I get a message from him and he said, I really want to study viral evolution. And I said, okay, cool. He's like, can you point me in the way of some kind of text around how that works? And then he said, cool, I read those papers. And I actually think some of the work that I've been, things I've been learning about natural language processing can be useful for understanding viral evolution. And, um, and so what do natural language processing algorithms do? For those of you not familiar, what these algorithms do is they can really extract a, a set of patterns from big data. And machine learning has transformed our lives in so many ways. Those of you who use Gmail, and now Gmail can predict the next word of your sentence, this is how it's done um, through these algorithms. And what these natural language processing algorithms really do is they learn distributional semantics. And this is a concept that was introduced in the 1950s. And the way to think about this is that you shall know a word by the company it keeps. So by looking at kind of local relationships, so words on either side of the word that you want to predict, or looking at long range relationships, you really can begin to have really good and accurate predictions of what word should go in a blank. And so to give you an example, you can think about the sentence, the Chinese president blank to Japan yesterday. And what these natural language processing algorithms do is they actually learn the probability of a word given its context. And so what the algorithm can return is it can look at the corpus of words in a particular language and then return the probability of a word filling in the blank. And you can see with this example, what the algorithm might predict is that the probability of the word went going into this blank has, is assigned a probability of 50%. Um, but what Brian also reasoned is that um, these algorithms can also begin to learn some aspect of semantics. And going back to something I alluded to at the beginning of small changes can have big impacts. So we can think about the following example. Um, the sentence, the boy pats the dog. Now we can change the A to an E and that sentence becomes the boy pets the dog. And semantically, intuitively, you might feel like, oh, okay, these two sentences are very similar and the grammar and the sentences are they're still grammatical. Now, by contrast, if we take that original sentence and change the P to an E, small change, but huge semantic impact. The boy eats the dog. And so you can imagine that this algorithm can say, like, actually, this is very semantically different. And so what we propose is this algorithmic framework to think about both grammar and semantics simultaneously. And this is what we called constrained semantic change search. And the idea is that you have a sequence of tokens from some, from some language, and you want to find the single token change that does the following, induces the largest semantic change, but is constrained by the rules or the grammar of that language. And the analogy we pursued here is that you could think about this from the language of words in English, but you could also think about the sequence of amino acids from a viral protein. And for those of you who, um, like machine learning or like neural networks, the way that our algorithm works is we're trained on a language model using state-of-the-art neural network models where we can take the hidden layers of our um, neural network and use that uh, to form our semantic representation. And then we can take the model output that for grammaticality for that probability of the word um, filling in that blank to be grammaticality. So these are the two features that we can extract from our model. And just to give you an example for how this model operates in English, we can take the original news headline, wine growers revel in good season. And we can ask the algorithm to go ahead and make the um, use constrained semantic change search. So find a grammatical um, substitution to the sentence of a single token or single word in this case that preserves grammaticality and is semantically similar. And the proposal that the algorithm makes is wine growers revel in strong season. So I hope you can feel like, okay, the algorithm is returning something that kind of makes intuitive sense. Now let's say, okay, let's make the, let's change the semantics as far as you can, but again, uh, preserve the grammar. And I just love this example because it says wine growers revel in flu season. And so you can imagine kind of the semantic feeling of the sentence is a little bit different. Um, and this is what the best, 
um, uh, substitution that the algorithm could make that was still grammatical, but had the highest semantic, uh, semantic change. Okay, and so um, thinking about that, and for those of you who've been following all of the viral evolution and variants of concern, if you think about the, what's happening with a virus, it's something very similar. And so you could think about it from the perspective of, could you think about modeling viral escape as semantic change? Where you can imagine that the reason that some of these antibodies that are being elicited through vaccination no longer work is because they can no longer bind to the viral protein of interest. So we can think about this antibody binding to this region of the influenza, the flu protein, uh, influenza hemagglutinin protein, and a single amino acid change a histidine to a serine can render this antibody totally unable to bind. And so what we reasoned is that we could actually use the corpus of public data through genomic surveillance. And instead of training with news headlines, let's just go ahead and train with all of the sequence information that's out there. And importantly, um, this is a concept in machine learning where we're actually totally unsupervised. So we're not telling the algorithm anything other than the sequence alone. And so what was really exciting is that we could ask the algorithm, now let's train on sequence and ask the model to give us semantics of our virus. And importantly, while we didn't train with any additional metadata because these genomic surveillance programs are actually quite great and they have associated metadata, we could say, let's take all the semantic representation, which is this high dimensional data, compress it down into dimensions, cluster the data and say, do these clusters have any biological meaning? And the short answer is yes. So we can say, take associated flu subtype data, take the clusters, cl take the clustering that emerge as a consequence of our semantic, uh, semantic information as learned by the model and project that down into two dimensions. And what you can see is that all these clusters are very much the same color. And these are actually corresponding to different uh, hemagglutinin protein subtypes of influenza. So what this suggests is that actually, while we're making this analogy about semantics, we're, we're, we're also doing is we're capturing something that has biological meaning. And so we said, okay, that gives us confidence to move forward. And so what we wanted to do is we said, for a good escape mutation, what you could imagine wanting is a mutation that's going to change the overall structure and fitness of the virus as opposed to a functionally neutral mutation. So we'll call that high semantic change, but you still want a virus that can infect cells. So we wanna preserve that grammar. And so what we can do is we can actually do what's happening in people in you know, all across the world where the virus is mutating. But what we can do is we can actually ex explore the entire like potential combinatorial space of all mutations that can be made. So we can actually do this all in the computer where we use our computational model to say, okay, let's go ahead and mutate every individual amino acid and then ask what does the model predict for how this mutation changes in terms of grammaticality and semantic change. And to make a long story short, because people have actually done in the laboratory many of these same exact experiments where we're just trying to make a library of different viral mutants and ask which ones can survive. People have actually done these experiments in the laboratory where you can make a library of different viruses, subject them to antibodies or no antibody, and then ask what are the viruses that can survive immune selection? So similar to the way that we hope that our vaccinations uh, bring us, generate good antibodies that can protect us against viral infection. And then we can also ask about what are those viruses that actually still even just maintain the baseline ability to infect cells. And to make a long story short, we can ask the algorithm to tell us what are those mutations that have high grammaticality and high semantic change? And what is the relationship with the experimentally determined escape mutations? And to make a long story short, I'll just tell you the punchline. So if we plot every potential mutation as a function of semantic change or grammaticality, we see this kind of quadrant of high grammaticality and high semantic change. And all of the red axes are the known escape mutations. And what I hope you can see here is that our algorithm can do a pretty good job
of predicting those experimentally verified escape mutations. So using this kind of concept from natural language processing, we are able to, in kind of like in a totally experimental experiment, um, wet lab experiment free setting, predict mutations that allow you to escape uh, antibody neutralization. And this is really important because you can imagine we would like to know this, and especially in the setting of genomic surveillance or in the middle of a pandemic, this would be really powerful. So I'm showing you this one example from uh, one strain of the flu. And one question you might ask is, does this approach generalize? And what I want to just you to take away from this slide is that it does. For um, influenza H3, it works for HIV, and it also works for coronavirus. So this is really exciting. And just to conclude this part of the talk, this approach that we've used um, allows us to predict viral escape in a totally unsupervised alignment-free fashion. And for those of you who are not super deep into kind of genomic surveillance, what this means is that we can predict uh, viral escape very easily compared to what has been done in the past, that we can actually take this analogy from linguistics and apply it into a totally different setting. And what we think that we can do with this is that we can enable therapeutic design that anticipates avenues of escape. Um, and, you know, this is only possible by the virtue of being at MIT, where you have these students who kind of stumble into your lives and kind of change the arc of your own intellectual history. And so just to give you kind of a fun outcome of all of this, you know, um, it's, the, it's the hope and dream of, I think, anybody in research that what you do in the lab can make an impact in people's lives. So here's just a map of this website called NextStrain, which has been tracking uh, using genomic surveillance to kind of track the dynamics of the pandemic in real time. And we have been fortunate enough to like for this algorithm to be so powerful that the CDC has actually adopted it into its practice. Um, so this is something that we started um, a year ago in terms of building the algorithm. And I have to say like it's kind of amazing to know that like this is now being used by genomic surveillance programs to really try to understand the pandemic in real time. And if we see a sequence that we think has high grammaticality and high semantic change, hey, that is cause for alert. It's cause for a more experiment and it's cause to kind of understand um, how we may need to potentially update vaccines. So with that, I will close. Um, I, um, I always have to end my talks by, again, acknowledging the superheroes of the story. So Brian He did the computational work uh, that I described to you in the second half of the talk. Sydney Solomon did all the experimental work looking at the muted responses to TB. I love being at MIT in part because I have both amazing uh, students. I have not been able to tell you about all of their work. Um, amazing colleagues and mentors. All of the computational work was done with like my like my best colleague, faculty friend, Bonnie Berger. She's a mathematician and member of the computer science department at MIT. And I'm grateful to my funding sources. And if you wanna find out more about us, uh, you can find us on Twitter or on the internet. And I'm happy to take any questions that people have. All right, thank you, uh, Brian. Um, so uh, what should we do? Should we just, if you want, I. I see Diana has a question. Why don't you unmute yourself and ask your question? You can use the raised hand thing. I was, I was just clapping, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, nice job, Brian. Um, we were wondering back on the TB side of things, you had the monkey uh, immune response. Is that naturally goes down after about 90 days on its own or what do you think is going on in the second half there? Yeah, so that's that's an interesting question. Um, so you know, so with TB, what happens is that you have um, you have a period of kind of uncontrolled bacterial replication until you have enough bacteria that the rest of the immune system kicks in, and then you have you have kind of two waves of the you have multiple waves of the immune system, but you have the innate immune response, which is kind of like your blunt tool. There's not a lot of precision. They're just kind of like they're kind of your first line of infantry. And then you have the adaptive immune system that has can evolve to respond to specific pathogens. And that comes in about 
four to six weeks after infection. So you have this kind of unchecked period where like your first line of defense is on the innate, uh, on the innate immune side. And then you have the adaptive immune cells and they kind of come in and kind of can make the infection wane. And so that's what I think what we're seeing is we kind of have this like increase until the innate immune, the adaptive immune system kicks in and then they kind of drive things down. Gotcha, thanks. Paul? Uh -huh. You need to mute, unmute yourself. I can un I will unmute. Oh, thank you. I, uh, I'm a member of the Thoreau Society, and I remember he died of tuberculosis uh, when he was around 50. And, uh, and then Emerson's uh, brother died of tuberculosis, and Emerson's wife died, uh, first wife died. And people were dying like fleas of tuberculosis. And yet in my lifetime, we've got it pretty well under control. How did we do that? Well, this is, before, you know, was it, was it through sanitariums or isolation or, I mean. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. And I think here in the US, we've done a really good job um, because of a few things. We have access to some of the best healthcare in the world. Uh, you know, if nobody's too far from uh, antibiotics these days. You know, the last time we had a really strong TB outbreak was actually right at the time of the HIV, the start of the HIV epidemic, because HIV is something that is known to kind of kick, um, uh, like reactivate people's latent TB infection. So what I'll say, the reason that we don't have people in the U.S. Um, succumbing to TB very often is because we have a really great a system to distribute antibiotics um, and a really great system to kind of monitor public health dynamics and know when we have know when we have a problem. Now, I'll say in other parts of the world we don't have those kind of privileges, and as a consequence, um, you know, it's a lot harder to be able to get people those resources. Is part have... of is part of what helps that it's slow growing. Yeah, so also like, yes, if you can diagnose TB early and then give people access to give people antibiotics sooner, that's really helpful if you can make sure that people also stay on, right? I think one of the other challenges that we have observed in the field is that you can give, you can start people on antibiotics, um, but if they don't stay on it, that's actually sometimes worse than not starting in the first place because resistance is something that happens. We're seeing it happen in people with COVID. Every pathogen is designed to try to survive. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's what I'll say. Uh, Paul, do you have a follow? Well, I just a comment. I believe before we had antibiotics that they controlled it by uh, didn't people with TB have to go into sanitariums or be isolated or something like that before we had uh, before we had uh, antibiotics? Yeah, absolutely. So yes, yeah, so people were sent to sanatoriums. There were like lots of different kind of experimental therapies that were applied. You know, I um, I'll say that um, that is obviously a good. That's a good public health intervention. You know, some people were sent to the mountains because they thought they the air was better up there, um, and so you know, and uh, the immune response the immune response can succeed, right? So if you're not being bombarded with a whole host of other um, challenges, um, be that. Uh, uh, diet related, other infect, other co-infections. Yes, the immune response can naturally try to attenuate the bacterial burden. Um, so that is one of the ways in which we, uh, in which those sanatoriums were incredibly powerful. Is that it gave you just kind of this period of uninterrupted kind of absence of other co-infections or comorbidities to truly really try to um, just um, modulate your immune response. Thanks. So with this uh, new technique of um, finding variants that are, that are um, viable, I guess, does that mean that, that vaccines can be sort of broadened to, you, you can anticipate the, that the virus is gonna change in, in certain ways and, and broaden the, what the vaccine attacks? 
Yeah. So one of the one of the interesting concepts is to try to um, um, one of the ways that we're thinking about it at the very least is to try to use this concept of trying to find those regions that actually um, our model would predict as not being able to tolerate a lot of uh, mutation because of the grammaticality or semantic change. And then if you were to Im imagine that these would be the, if the virus made the muta this natural mutation, it would render itself uh, non-viable. So if we could actually make um, uh, vaccines that could target those regions of the protein, that would mean that like, you've got either one of two options. The virus could try to mutate to avoid the antibody that targets that, right? But then the kind of the Achilles heel of that strategy is that you render yourself non-viable. So we actually think that our kind of, our algorithmic framework can help, help you try to prioritize regions of an antibody um, or regions of a protein that would actually be um, uh, appealing for vaccine targets. And actually we can show this for flu because um, we can actually go back to the structure of the, of the hemagglutinin protein on the surface of flu. And what we know is that there, um, our model actually predicts a region of the protein that is what we'll call depleted for escape as predicted by the model. And people have actually already shown in people that if you can raise antibodies that recognize what's called a stock domain of the HA protein, what is known is that then those antibodies that you generate can be broadly neutralizing across a whole host of different strains of flu. So these are the people who like actually don't really succumb to seasonal flu because they have antibodies that like are kind of invariant and non don't really care about the mutation that was made. So you can discover the Achilles heel of the virus. That sort of notice that that is the hope. That is the hope. <laughs> uh, right, right. I, 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 I was thinking that uh, that uh, yeah, but what uh, Dan was talking about was something like what they do for flu vaccines every year, and there's a new one every year because flu vaccine has a relatively high mutation rate. The flu yeah. Virus. yeah, flu virus. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's what we're trying to do. So we think that our algorithm can help us. Now, you know, our algorithm can tell us the region. Now the, then what the, what the pharma companies need to do is they need to actually come up with a vaccine strategy that would allow you to target that region of the protein. And that's actually one of the biggest challenges. Although I really read, I, I, I skimmed this really exciting paper where it seems as though like using these nanoparticle formulations, um, people have actually been able to now have a vaccination strategy that seems to robustly target the stem part of uh, the hemagglutinin protein. So I actually think that a paper just yesterday came out that kind of confirms the model, the predictions of our model. So you think that this is gonna be more broadly applicable what's, what's been learned from COVID, excuse me, what's been learned from COVID can now be used to fight flu and things like that, is that? I absolutely do think so. I think, you know, that that's, you know, um, as an immunologist, you know, like I could selfishly be like, I lost a year of my lab, but I, I can also think about it as I gain, it's a, a lot of people did a bunch of additional experiments for me that I didn't have to pay for, right? Never in human history have we had so many different vaccine concepts tested at once. And you can now, because of, because of how we've like harmonized and normalized, um, a lot of our measurement techniques. Now, like I, in like six months when all the data become publicly available, I can ask, okay, I think that TB vaccines need this flavor of immune response. And then I can look across all of the vaccine concepts that have been tested and say, this is the vaccine concept that is most likely to generate the type of immune response that I like. And so I, um, you know, I, I am an eternal optimist. Um, and that is how I operate. And as a consequence, like it gives me hope that this, that this pandemic will actually, has actually unlocked a whole number of different opportunities for other infectious diseases, because we have had this transformative uh, moment in vaccinology, vaccine testing, 
immunological profiling, all of those things. And I hope that as a community, as we've kind of uh, reached across the scientific aisle, so to speak, between lots of different communities, that we can also keep those, keep those lines of communication open to keep the kind of information flowing between groups because that has that is why we've succeeded so quickly so do you ever run into uh problems uh, along those lines if because people want to commercialize whatever it is they're working on so they they keep kind of closed mouth about how it works and and so on um yeah, that can be that can be challenging. Um, you know, I'll say the infectious disease community. Um, you know, um, you know, the hard thing about studying TB is that pharma companies have literally zero interest in it. Um, so the TB community, as a consequence, is like like there's you know like yes, some people care a lot about intellectual property, but most of us are really in it for the for the impact from the public health perspective, as opposed to like own personal gain, right? Like I'm not, like even if I come up with a great concept, I need to find like, um, I need to, if, if even if I come up with a great concept, I'm gonna need philanthropy to fill the gap um, in terms of making it viable for in distribution and, and implementation. So as a consequence, I think our community is super open. Um, a, you know, getting information out of pharma can be a little bit more difficult because sometimes they don't want to show you everything. But it's, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, enough has been done that we can try to extract meaningful information. And, you know, like the other thing about it is now as people are beginning to be vaccinated, whether pharma wants to give us the information or not, we can enroll our own cohorts and ask, what vaccine were they administered and what type of immune response was elicited. So if pharma doesn't want to do it, we can do it ourselves. All right, further questions? That, that brings up, so, so the problem with TB is that it's, it's a disease of the poor. Is that what you're saying? And therefore there's, there's no money in it. Yep. Thank you very much. I guess uh, I don't see any further questions. We will... Uh, uh, we will adjourn. Thank right. you so much. Take care. Good night.